You're Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Alex Doolin is my name. I must talk to you. I'm in desperate need of your advice. Well, come in, my lad. Come in. Oh, uh, permit me to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Watson? Watson? Well, I... Oh! Oh, my goodness, be a patient. Oh, I do beg your pardon, meeting you standing there like that most remiss of me. There, if you sit down, I'll, I'll be with you in a moment. My dear doctor, Mr. Dougal is not your patient. He's come to see me. Huh? Huh. about a matter which I imagine has something to do with the uh, injury you sustained, eh? About a matter which might prove even more disastrous to a certain young lady if she's allowed to marry this man without somebody telling her. But on the other hand, how can I tell her when... You're uh, jumping about rather a lot, Mr. Dougal. Uh, mentally, of course. Yes, yes, forgive me. I'd better begin by telling you that I'm known to most people by a name other than Alex Dougal. Yes? Aunt Lottie. Aunt Lottie? I write under that name in the Daily Observer. I'm a columnist. But Aunt Lottie? I know. It was the boss's idea. I'm really a sports writer. Don't ask me why I was assigned the job, but... I do an advice for the Lovelorn column. Oh, I see. You mean the readers write into you telling you their problems? And I answer them. The boss thought they'd be more apt to listen to a nice, sweet old Aunt Lottie than a Alex Dougal. Well, of course, he may have a point there, Mr. Dougal. They listen to me, all right. Act on every word I say. And that's what started all the trouble. You'll have to go back with me two weeks. I'd received a letter from a young lady who identified herself only with the initials S.D. She said that her father had just died and she had nobody to advise her but me. It seems that her fiancé was a man of violent temper and had on one occasion almost throttled another man for even looking at her. She wanted to know if it would be wise to marry him. I answered her, and a day later in the editorial room, I came to know what I had touched off. around, just point her out. Now, wait a minute. It just so happens that I'm Aunt Lottie, and I want to know how you got in here. You're Aunt Lottie? That's correct. And you can be certain that if you've come with any problem, I shall be most uncooperative. Are you sure you're Aunt Lottie? That is my pen name. Have you any objections? None. None at all. I'm absolutely delighted to find that Aunt Lottie is a man. Really? Why? Because I would never dream of doing this to a woman. What's the meaning of this? You received a letter the other day from a young lady asking whether it was wise to marry her fiancé, a man of violent temper. That's right. You replied in your column yesterday that it would be most unwise. It is. But what's it got to do with you? I know. Don't tell me. You are the fiancé. Aunt Lottie, you have a lot of mending to do. Mending? In your column tomorrow, I want you to take back every word. It's impossible. My publishers would never allow it. Right, then you'll go and see her personally. Her name is Susan Deering. Her address is 116 Chatham Hills Road, Barhampton. When you get back, I shall expect to hear that she has refixed the wedding date. Now, wait a minute. You can't intimidate me. I gave her my honest advice, and I intend to stick to it. What did you say? I intend to... You were saying? 
I just wanted to know what the address was again. Miss Deering. I'm the housekeeper. Your name, please. Aunt Lottie. No, I have not been drinking. Come in. Wait here, please. I'll call her. I'd hardly expected when I left London that Miss Susan Deering would be living in surroundings such as this. Most of my readers were shop girls. Girls from a modest background, anyway. But Susan Deering was an heiress. I realized this when I recognized the subject in the painting above the fireplace. He was Oliver Deering, the chemical manufacturer who six months ago had suffered a heart attack while pursuing his favorite sport, bicycling. He was undoubtedly her father. How do you do? How do you do? Are you really Aunt Lottie? I'm afraid so. My editor felt it would inspire more confidence than a name like Alex Dougal, which is my own. But I don't agree with your editor at all. Oh, really? I never fail to read your columns. They're always so full of wisdom and understanding. Almost like Father used to talk before he died. Well, thank you. But if I didn't think so, I never would have written to you. Never have, have called off my wedding. Well, as a matter of fact, that's what I came to talk to you about, Miss Deering. Do you mind if we sit down? Oh, please, yes. Here you're hurt and I've kept you standing. Just a little accident. Nothing at all. Yet. Would you like a pillow or something? Oh, no, no, thank you. What bothers me more than any little ache is the advice that I gave you in my column. The advice you gave me? But every word of it was so true. It cleared up everything. Well, I felt the same thing at the time also. But after meeting your fiancé, Mr. Murdoch... You met Jack? Oh, quite by accident. He struck you. I know he forced you to come here and see me. Oh, no, no, not at all. Then how were you hurt? I fell down the stairs. It was an accident. Forgive me. It's quite obvious that that a man like you could never be forced to do anything against his will. Well, I should hope not. But at any rate, after meeting Mr. Murdoch, I felt it my responsibility to come here and retract my original advice. Forgive me, Miss Deering. That's what I've been telling her. No one is perfect, naturally, but Mr. Murdoch is eligible in every other way. He has gold mines in Africa, if that's what Tilda means. And I could be sure he wasn't marrying me for my inheritance. Mr. Dougal, you've never seen him when he loses his temper. Uh, Miss Deering, have you ever heard of a Dr. Freud? No. A young Viennese, he's invented a new science called psychoanalysis. He says that a temper is a perfectly healthy, normal outlet for emotions. It's quite normal. Mr. Dougal, you know so much. <laughs> That's my job. I'll write to Jack immediately and tell him it's all right again. Good. And if you have a picture of the two of you, I'll see that it's published in the society page under... under soon to be betrothed. Mr. Dougal, what's the matter? Something happened to my back when I fell. I wonder, would you mind putting one hand on my shoulder and one in the small of my back and pull? Thank you. Mr. Dougal, you must do something about your back. When you get home tonight, have your wife rub it with liniment. I'm afraid that's not entirely possible, but I'll have the man at the club do it anyway. You mean to say that, uh, that you're not married? I'm afraid not. It seems that every time I meet a girl that interests me, she's not available. <laughs> but then that's life. There's always tomorrow, and, well, who knows? I might be as lucky as you and Mr. Murdoch. Now, what about that picture? I'll get it for you. All the way back to London, my eyes kept returning to the snapshot that had been given me and to Murdoch's face. 
I really hadn't had time to study him when he first came into my office. Everything had happened so fast. But now I had the clinging feeling that I'd seen him somewhere before. But where? And under what circumstances? Hello, Dougal. I trust you were successful. Extremely. And I'm going back with even more confidence to make her change her mind next time. You're not Jack Murdoch. And you don't have any gold mines in Africa. You're Freddie Brill, the racetrack fixer. Now, whatever gave you that idea? I used to be a sports writer for your information, and I remember you very well. You got flung in jail for nearly killing a jockey that double-crossed you. And if you don't think I can prove it, just come down to the library and I'll show you a back issue with your picture in it. That won't be necessary. I didn't think it would be. So it's her inheritance you're after, is it? That's it. And I don't think you'll be telling her. What are you going to do? First, I'm going to make you best man at my wedding. What? After today, I can't trust you out of my sight. As best man, you have reason for being at my side every minute. But this is insane! Secondly, I make you this promise. If Susan should learn of my true identity before we're married, I won't make inquiries as to who told her. I'll assume it was you. And if it's the last thing I do, I'll kill you. Now, we return to the case of the violent suitor. I'm always giving out advice myself, but here I am, strangely enough, asking for it. What shall I do? If I expose Murdoch, he'll obviously take his revenge on me. But on the other hand, how can I allow poor Susie to be victimized that way? I see. So it's Susie, is it? Well, up until half an hour ago, when I managed to get away from him, Murdoch keeps me handcuffed to his side. And naturally, when he saw Miss Deering, I did also. Ah, yes, yes. Quite naturally. Well, there's no point in denying it that she does something strange to me. And I found myself wanting to be the groom instead of the best man. That may very well happen yet, Mr. Dougal. But how with Murdoch still in the picture? We'll remove him from the picture. Well, it's simply stated, Holmes. But surely you don't mean to expose Murdoch and risk Mr. Dougal's life. No, no, Watson. If any lives are going to be risked, they'll be yours and mine. Oh. Oh. My plans aren't crystallized yet, Mr. Dougal, but my advice to you is to go back to Mr. Murdoch and continue to be his best man. You'll hear from me very soon. I'll do anything you say, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Not at all. Oh, wait. It's all right. I just wanted to make certain that Murdoch wasn't waiting for you outside. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Good day. Good day. Good day. And how do you propose to help Mr. Dougal? By removing Murdoch from the picture. But how? By proving that he killed Miss Deering's father. What? Safely behind bars, Murdoch could neither marry Miss Deering or harm Dougal. But Miss Deering's father died of a heart attack. He was cycling. You heard it yourself. My dear Watson, it was made to appear as if he had been bicycling. Well, now, really, Holmes, you haven't even left the room. How can you say such a thing? Ah, here it is. I thought I'd kept it. Have a look. When that picture was published in the papers, I showed it to Inspector Lestrade as proof that Oliver Deering was murdered. But the good old inspector, with his usual dim-wittedness, refused to pay any attention to it. Well, I must say I can't see any signs of murder here. Uh, notice Deering's coat. Yes, well... It's buttoned on the left side. So? Have a look at your own. Well, yes, I see that, but... It's my theory that Deering was at home in his shirt sleeves when Murdoch struck him a blow on the back of the head that killed him. Then, in an effort to disguise his crime, Murdoch, with the aid of a woman, dressed Deering and deposited him and his bicycle on a lonely stretch of country road. But the mistake had been made of buttoning his coat on the wrong side. Yes, but, but look here, just a minute. You've just talked about a woman. What woman? Well, his accomplice, of course. 
A woman would be more apt to button Deering's coat on the left side since it was customary for her to button hers in that way. And talking of coats, I think you'd better take yours. It's going to be chilly in the country tonight. Well, assuming everything you say is true, what's the motive in killing Deering? Well, my guess is that uh, Deering found out Murdoch's true identity and prevented him marrying his daughter. And Murdoch, seeing himself losing a fortune, lost his temper again. Come on, Watson. We'll pick up Lestrade on the way. Right. Take my coat. about that. Don't you talk to him like that. I'll talk to him any way I choose. Not around me, Jack Murdoch, you won't. Tea is served. Nothing like a nice cup of tea to relax everyone. If you don't keep your temper, you'll ruin everything. It's all right, Tilda. I'll pour. I think of it, of course. Of course what? The accomplice, it's Tilda. The housekeeper? Yes, it would have to be someone normally attached to the house to have been present at the murder. Tilda fits the part perfectly. She would also have to know Murdoch. And from the manner in which she's just been talking to him, that's obvious too. Your theory sounds as wild now as it did when you first told it to me. Lestrade, give me your gun, will you? What for? Well, I'm just going to put my theory to the test. Wait a minute. Oh, don't worry, I shan't hurt anyone. Thunder made you do a thing like this. No time to explain now. They'll, they'll have the staff out and search the grounds. If they find us, the whole plan's ruined. Well, now, where's Lestrade? Lestrade! Shh, Lestrade! He was behind us when I lost. Look. Oh, confound him. If they find him, everything will be ruined. Here, we'd better go and find him ourselves. Lestrade. Lestrade. Oh, no, Holmes, look. <sighs> well, well, well. Only the good inspector could have managed that. <laughs> well, the straight, you look like a stranded whale. <laughs> <laughs> what is this thing? <laughs> it's a Babington net. Were you running with your eyes shut? Here. Holmes. Regardless, I expect. They're coming this way. We've got to get to the carriage. Come on, Lestrade. Get me out of this thing. Oh, there's no time for that. Come on. I see no item in the entire evening, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, that would prompt laughter. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Stray, but, but I shall cherish the memory of you thrashing about on that badminton court for years to come. <laughs> I wouldn't find it so amusing, Holmes, if it had been you who had torn that confounded net from its moorings. <laughs> Mr. Stray, it was simply a question of going under it after all. And I haven't forgotten that it was your insane behavior tonight that made it necessary for us to be running at all. Yes, what were you up to, Holmes? Those shots, I mean. Yes, I assume there was a purpose. Oh, a very definite purpose, Lestrade. Those three bullets were bait for a trap. 
Odd bait, I must say. I trust it was the perfect bait for our purpose. I only hope that our delayed departure from the Deerings won't make us too late to see the trap sprung. You mean it wasn't sprung at the Deering? There were too many people there, Watson. You see, if my theory is correct, then Jack Murdoch's flat should be the place. And I wonder if we can entice this driver to go just a little bit faster. Cabby! Cabby, go as quick as you can. Susan and grabbing a fortune for us. For yourself, you mean? You never had any intention of sharing it with me. What are you talking about? 50,000 pounds is yours the day I'm married. Didn't I promise it to you? Yes, but your circumstances were different then. I saw you kill Mr. Deering, and you got panicky that I would run to the police. But time's gone by, and now you've found a surer and cheaper way to keep me quiet. What do you mean? Back at the house before, you had someone try to kill me. Tilda, I told you, I swear I know nothing about those shots. You could never make me believe that. There's only one person in this world who would benefit by my death, and that person is you. I'll never feel safe while you're alive. I wouldn't do that if I were you, miss. Drop that gun. You're under arrest. We heard everything you said. You were tricked, Tilda. It was the police fired those shots at you? Well, Mr. Holmes here anyway. Hmm. I had a feeling it would stir things up a bit. It's an old adage that partners in crime never trust one another. Get down! <laughs> I've been practicing my ride ever since I met him. Ah, well done, my boy. Well done. You'd better come along too, miss. I believe I've outgrown the Aunt Lottie label now. I'm going to ask Susan to marry me. Good for you. First thing tomorrow morning. It's, it's too late tonight. Oh, I don't think it's too late. You don't? No. Definitely not. I'll go right now. Good idea. Well, Holmes, you've solved the mystery and brought two young lovers together. I think I'm going to call you Aunt Lottie. What? Oh, no, really, Watson. This time you've gone too far. <laughs> 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 